Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. Today, we're following up with the rest of the GPU news announced at CES 2022. So far, we've already looked at all of AMD's announcements, and Steve has chimed in with a review of the just announced Intel Core i7-12700 CPU as well. So go back and watch those videos if you have missed them. But in this video, we'll be giving our thoughts on the rather lackluster announcements from NVIDIA, as well as some additional details on Intel's upcoming Arc discrete GPU series. First up, let's talk about the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090 Ti. I mean, Ti. The RTX 3090 Ti, our next BFGPU. They're really insisting on that whole Ti thing, aren't they, NVIDIA? It's just not gonna happen. Anyway, this was a really, underwhelming announcement for what should be NVIDIA's fastest ever consumer graphics card. To come out on the big stage of CES and say, hey, we have this new top tier GPU, but you'll have to wait until later in the month to learn more is pretty bizarre to be honest. Surely here's a company you'd want to show the best stuff you have while a big audience is watching. Anyway, what we do know for now is that NVIDIA are claiming FP32 performance of 40 teraflops for the 3090 Ti, which is 12% higher than the rated performance of the RTX 3090. While NVIDIA didn't actually provide the full specs for this new GPU, rumors have been floating around for a while now, and it's widely expected to feature the full GA102 die, meaning an increase from 82 SMs in the 3090 to 84 SMs in the 3090 Ti. In addition, we're expecting to see higher clock speeds and a higher power limit, rumored at 450 watts, on those SMs to achieve 12% higher FP32 performance. The memory system has also been improved. We're still getting 24GB of GDDR6 memory, but NVIDIA are upgrading the speed of that memory to 21 gigabits per second, up from 19.5 gigabits per second, so an 8% increase there. When combined with the SM clock and power upgrades, in real-world gaming, we're probably going to be looking at a high single-digit performance upgrade over the RTX 3090, although NVIDIA hasn't shown any of their own benchmark data just yet. And yeah, that's basically all that was said. No launch date and no pricing information, not even full specs, although they did show off the Founders Edition card, which looks very similar to the RTX 3090. We can expect a full reveal of the GPU later in January, but... Geez, not an eventful reveal by any stretch. Of course, the GPU itself will likely be a prime target for miners anyway. The RTX 3090 already sells for twice its MSRP, and improvements to memory performance will help out miners a fair bit. So it should be even more sought after. I wouldn't be surprised to see a real price well in excess of $3,000 US, but we'll have to wait and see how that one pans out. The next graphics card, and the one that NVIDIA was more willing to talk about, was the GeForce RTX 3050, bringing a current gen 50 class GPU to desktops for the first time, well after the launch of these parts in laptops midway through last year. The RTX 3050 for desktops is more like the RTX 3050 Ti in laptops, bringing 20 SMs for 2560 CUDA cores in total, along with the usual layout of 20 RT cores and 80 Tensor cores. The base clock is listed as 1550 MHz with a boost up to 1780 MHz in NVIDIA's official spec sheet. On the memory side, we're looking at 8GB of GDDR6. I'm very pleased here that NVIDIA hasn't gimped the RTX 3050 on desktops with 4GB of memory like they did on the laptop side. 8GB should be sufficient for this class of GPU. It's on a 128-bit bus and should be clocked at 14 gigabits per second. The whole GPU has a 130-watt TGP and supports all the stuff you'd expect like NVENC, Rebar, DLSS, all that stuff. As for the GPU die itself, NVIDIA so far hasn't revealed this information, and normally here I'd expect it to be a GA107 die, as that's what this sort of configuration uses in RTX 3050 Ti laptops. However, there is some speculation the die is actually a cut-down GA106, that die being the one currently used for the RTX 3060. This could mean desktop RTX 3050s are being made from defective RTX 3060 dies rather than a full GA107 die, which would have a different set of supply considerations, but we'll have to wait and see to get that sort of confirmation. Performance-wise, NVIDIA are claiming 9 teraflops of FP32 performance, down from nearly 13 teraflops with the RTX 3060. That makes total sense, as we're only getting 71% of the SMs you get in the 3060. A lot of NVIDIA's gaming performance charts were kind of useless. I mean, showing the RTX 3050 versus the GTX 1650 in ray tracing games, 
doesn't tell us much about how this card would stack up against other cards like the RTX 2060 or RTX 3060, but I guess the expectation here is that the 3050 is slower than both of those cards, and normally a company, you know, they wouldn't compare a new GPU to something that's slower. In the one useful comparison shown, the RTX 3050 is shown to be about twice the performance of the GTX 1650, which I guess is nice, but they're not really in the same class, the 1650 being a much more affordable $150 card back when it launched. That would put the 3050 around the mark of the GTX 1660 Ti, plus the addition of ray tracing and DLSS support, which are also nice feature additions. The RTX 3050 will be available on January 27th at an MSRP of $250, US which, like with the recently announced AMD Radeon RX 6500 XT, we expect that to be a fake MSRP that may only be reflective of a very early batch of GPUs sold. Pretty much every single GPU launched in the last 18 months has only been briefly seen at the MSRP, if ever, and we don't expect that trend to be any different with the RTX 3050. The MSRP itself is nothing amazing too, especially if the card is like a GTX 1660 Ti with RTX features. The 1660 Ti launched at $280 back in early 2019, so this would represent only a small improvement in price to performance in the crucial sub $300 market going on what Nvidia has revealed so far. But that's not too much of a surprise as both Nvidia and AMD are creeping up prices this generation in response to insane demand and ensure they're taking a larger portion of the real sales price in instead of it all going to scalpers. So comparisons to previous generations are a bit fruitless and more of just a depressing look at how the market has shifted. As for the real price we expect for the RTX 3050, that's a harder one to gauge, and I don't think this GPU is as much of a turnoff for miners as the 6500 XT, which is a class below at a $200 MSRP, and it only has four gigabytes of memory. The 3050 still has an 8GB VRAM buffer and adequate memory bandwidth, so if the card is widely available at MSRP, it will almost certainly be gobbled up by miners. What you normally get on the market at that price right now is a GTX 1650, GTX 1063 GB or RX 580 4GB, and this new RTX 3050 is almost certainly going to be far superior than those cards for mining, so yeah, expect significant price inflation. Currently, NVIDIA GPUs are going for between 2 and 2.4 times their launch MSRP in the lower end of NVIDIA's product stack. The RTX 3060, for example, last time we checked, has a real price of about $750 versus its $330 MSRP. So using that as a guide would see a real price around $550 in my estimation, just below what we see from AMD's RX 6600. Keep in mind that used GTX 1660 Ti's and GTX 1660 Supers go for around $500 right now, so unless there is a massive oversupply of RTX 3050's and lower than expected demand, that's probably what we're facing on the scalper market. Of course, those that are lightning fast or extremely patient and willing to put up with shuffles or waiting lists should be able to get a bit closer to the MSRP, but we still expect AIBs themselves to inflate the prices of their offerings. It's what's happened every other time, and we have no reason to believe that will change. Expect our full review of the RTX 3050 later this month if you're interested in grabbing one, and despite a bit of negativity around the price point and the real price or whatever, any additional GPU supply is only going to help the situation. Yeah, it might end up being expensive, but the fact we've seen no new launches of typical mainstream GPUs in a very long time has contributed to the issues we're facing today. The RTX 3050 and RX 6500 XT should help in that area. The other big announcement from NVIDIA's CES press event were two new laptop GPUs, the GeForce RTX 3080 Ti and the GeForce RTX 3070 Ti, for laptops of course. These GPUs will sit alongside the existing 3080 and 3070 to provide additional options for laptop OEMs, and of course, the 3080 Ti is the fastest laptop GPU NVIDIA has made yet. The RTX 3080 Ti for laptops, aside from the you know, confusingly frustrating naming scheme making it so close to desktop cards that aren't the same, it's actually quite an interesting product. The previous flagship, the RTX 3080 laptop, was using a maxed out GA104 die with 48SM, so essentially the RTX 3080 laptop and RTX 3070 Ti desktop had the same core configuration. To increase the number of SMs, NVIDIA would have to go up a die size, and they've reportedly done something unusual in creating a new GA103 die to solve that problem. Not much is known about GA103 except that it sits between the much larger GA102 and existing GA104, allowing for an increased SM count in laptop form factors. 
This stops Nvidia from needing to jump all the way up to a 600 plus square millimeter die, which would have been one of the largest dies ever used in a laptop and it would have been hugely cut down for laptop use. The 3080 Ti for laptops ends up with 7,424 CUDA cores, which equates to 58 SMs, a 21% increase on the RTX 3080 for laptops. The clock speed is lower though, topping out at 1590 MHz versus 1710 MHz for the full power 150 watt configuration. Some laptops will push past that up to 175 watts using dynamic boost higher than previous models. There's also 16GB of GDDR6 memory on a 256-bit bus, and we're expecting to see 16 gigabits per second memory for the first time in NVIDIA's laptop lineup here. All the usual NVIDIA features are supported. Then for the RTX 3070 Ti laptop GPU, this should stick to using a regular GA104 die, and comes with 5,888 CUDA cores or 46 enabled SMs, the same configuration as the RTX 3070 for laptops. It matches the RTX 3070 laptop's power range at 80 to 125 watts, and to fit the increased core count in that power limit, clock speeds are lower at 1035 to 1485 MHz. The memory config with 8GB of GDDR6 is the same. In terms of performance, we only got a few benchmark charts, most of this showing comparisons to previous gen products. The 3080 Ti, for example, was shown as 40 to 50% faster than the RTX 2080 Super, and I'd expect it to be maybe 15% faster than the RTX 3080. And then for the 3070 Ti, they're pairing up against the 2070 Super and they're claiming an even higher margin there. But laptop performance is often quite complex, depends on the configuration, so this will of course require some full benchmarking. Laptops using these GPUs will be available starting February 1st, with the RTX 3080 Ti listed to start in $2,500 laptops and the 3070 Ti in $1,500 US laptops. Alongside these launches, NVIDIA are also updating their Max-Q technologies with new features such as CPU Optimizer to help optimize efficiency and deliver more power to the GPU, while also improving things on the CPU side, and Rapid Core Scaling to scale the amount of active GPU cores to the workload and potentially run them at higher frequencies for better performance. There's also an AI Enhanced Battery Boost 2.0 feature to improve gaming on battery, and they're quoting up to 70% battery life improvements there. And finally, Intel also talked about new GPUs at CES, although they were rather light on with details. The first of their announcements essentially amounted to, hey, don't forget about our upcoming ARC GPUs, they're still coming in Q1 of this year and they are shipping to OEMs now. This is paired with announcements from vendors like Acer, who debuted the first laptop set to use discrete ARC graphics in what is probably going to be the ARC A370M, according to one of their press releases. Some people were expecting to see a full lineup of ARC GPUs announced, but that didn't happen. Intel is still keeping under wraps the specs, performance, and everything else related to their discrete graphics cards for desktop gaming. If anything, we'll hear more towards the very end of Q1, which is the earliest we're expecting to see these GPUs. The other thing Intel talked about is their XE super sampling technology, XESS, and that is nearly ready to debut in games. Intel has partnered with 505 Games to integrate XESS in the upcoming title Death Stranding Director's Cut, which yeah, is a different release apparently to the regular Death Stranding game. The Director's Cut version is coming to PC this spring, again, Northern Hemisphere Spring, and it should be the first time we can take a look at XESS. Several other game studios are also on board for XESS integration, including Codemasters, Techland, and Ubisoft, among others. Like all of these sorts of technologies, expect adoption to be relatively limited in the beginning, especially until people know it's good and worth using. But it's good to hear there are some developers on board already. And that's really it for the major GPU announcements out of CES, in addition to the Radeon RX 6500 XT and new AMD laptop GPUs that we talked about in a previous video. January is shaping up to be quite a busy month for GPU launches, especially compared to prior months, and there's definitely more to come across the first quarter of this year. Unfortunately, pricing still remains high for GPUs, but hey, more releases and more supply is a good thing. Anyway, that's it for this video. If you are interested in supporting the Hardware Unbox channel and the independent testing that we do here, please consider just subscribing to the channel, giving this video a like. We do appreciate it. But if you do want to support us monetarily and directly, we do have our Patreon and Float Plan accounts in the description below. You'll gain access to monthly live streams, behind the scenes content, Discord chats, and you'll be supporting us buying hardware for testing. So thanks everyone, and we'll catch you in the next one.